So we can start. So good morning, everyone. My name is Eva Malona. I am the president and CEO of Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition, New England's largest uh, immigrant advocacy organization. I am so pleased for your presence today. These are extraordinary times. So I'm very grateful that you are making the time and you are with us today. And a special thank you to the members of the media as well. Um, I am so uh, pleased to welcome you on behalf of Mira and uh, very happy to say that we are here today to share with you the first uh, quantitative assessment of pandemic impact on immigrants and refugees across the state and uh, the policy implications. I wanted to thank you to thank the MIRA members. This is a collaboration with our members and especially uh, Agencia Alpha, ATASC, the Brazilian Worker Center, IFSI, uh, USA, Reach Beyond Domestic Violence uh, for collaborating with us. Special thanks to my colleagues, Marion Davies, who led this project for us and worked tirelessly and on the survey and the interviews, this survey is done in 15 languages, no easy task. And also a special thank you to a firm who funded this project. Firm, it's the Fair Immigration um, Reform Movement, a national network that Mira is very proud to be part of, uh, based in DC working on um, immigration um, reform. I just wanted to um, say that we all know that the coronavirus pandemic has hurt our communities. We heard it from our members who are still distributing food and are helping families to cope with this very difficult situation. We have seen the COVID-19 data that the state has shared with us which shows the Latino and Black communities getting sick at very high rates. As of this week alone, uh, Latinos counted for 28.9% of confirmed cases, 2.3 times their share of the population. We know that several immigrant-rich communities were hotspot, you know, notably Chelsea, that had five times more than statewide rates. Uh, other, um, other hotspot, Lawrence and Brockton. We knew that. Um, we also knew that we didn't have a, what we didn't know is that we didn't have a systemic assessment of immigrants across Massachusetts and how they were affected by the pandemic. We wanted some hard data to share with you and we're very happy that we were able to, um, to do this. We asked in this survey, um, and I, forgive me, it was in 16 languages. We asked about jobs, about unemployment, about work, about commuting uh, to work, the commuting conditions itself. We asked about food and housing security. We asked about childcare and access to key safety net programs. Um, now to talk about uh, this and to walk you through all the findings of this survey, I will turn it over to uh, Marion Davies, who led this project. Thank you, Marion, for the amazing work that you have done. And also special thanks to Jessica Chico as well for supporting with this project. Uh, Marion, please take it away. Yes. So hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can see well on all of that. Um, so this was, uh, this, came, this came out of um, an idea where we, the Make the Road New York had done something similar. and. We just thought it was so powerful to, um, to have this data and, and what it could mean to do something similar for Massachusetts where we would be able to really understand quantitatively what, um, what people are going through and how it affects people when they are undocumented in particular. So uh, we did this survey in 16 languages. Uh, Don, you are personally responsible for 11 of those. Uh, so that was an amazing feat by ATASC. Um, and we also had uh, Portuguese, thanks to the uh, Brazilian, work, uh, Brazilian Women's Group, and Haitian Creole, thanks to IFSI, and uh, also French because of IFSI. 
And uh, we, we disseminated the survey on social media through our different contacts. Uh, I know that ESOL classes got it. You can, we, we get little clusters that we can see of people like, you know, from different areas. We had um, Agencia Alpha very, very generously lent us. Uh, Catherine, is, their intern is on here and she's amazing. And she did a whole bunch of outreach to people who were in Agencia Alfa's database, either because they had requested relief or because they had, in, a, in another way, engaged with Alfa. So we got a lot of different things. I went and stood in the food line with, at, at, a, sorry, at a, a Chelsea Collaborative. So we, we just did a whole bunch of things to get these answers. We ended up with 433 respondents from across Massachusetts including 149 households who include uh, an undocumented immigrant. That doesn't mean the whole family is undocumented. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, roughly 70% of the respondents answered online, the rest by phone and some in person. So this, is, um, this still is a, a survey that is biased towards people who are willing to answer um, and, uh, and to people who have enough capability to answer a Google form. So that you know, we probably have undercounted people who are very, very, very vulnerable. But it is still a very good sample of the Massachusetts immigrant community. You can see the geographic distribution. We had people from all over the state and that big blob in Boston, if you look at the little breakout, it breakdown in the, on the side, it, it's actually all the surrounding communities. So we're very comfortable that we got a really good geographic representation. And uh, the demographics are not a perfect uh, representation of, Mira, of uh, immigrants in Massachusetts, but they're actually a very good representation of who has been hit very hard. Uh, we did sample Asians very well. Um, we oversampled Latinos, and that includes Brazilians, though, so just be careful. Like, you know, this is not just Spanish speakers, but also Brazilians. Um, Haitians are represented in both the non Latinx Caribbean and the Black African American bars. Some people checked one, some checked both. Um, so that's how you have it. We did not do a sufficient job of getting um, Middle Eastern and North African folks, and we didn't have a lot of African immigrants either, although um, we know that there is some, we did get some responses, and we know that there are there is some need in that community as well. Um, you can see uh, the general distribution of how people, um, of what our, what kind of citizenship statuses or, or immigration status people had. Um, as you can see, 37% of the households uh, reported having at least one undocumented member in the family. The way that we broke this down, we deliberately tried to identify, you know, the difference between a citizen over 21 and a citizen under 21 is that a citizen over 21 can sometimes sponsor the non-citizens in the family, although there's a lot of complications to that. Um, also, you know, with, under, with uh, DACA recipients, TPS recipients have employment authorization. The same thing with people whose asylum case has advanced for a while and they have gotten an employment authorization. That's what EAD stands for. And sorry for the abbreviations, but uh, it's hard to, fill, to, to fit all these things into a, into a slide. So that's why I had to do it that way. Um, Here's a breakdown of the people who have, of the undocumented and mixed status households. And you can see that um, about two in five, pretty much the, it, it, the entire household is undocumented. But we also have about a quarter where the, uh, the parents uh, are undocumented and the kids are, doc are US citizens, which is a very common thing. 80% of the children of, um, of immigrants in Massachusetts are US born, so that fits right in. Um, and you can see just how many of these households have U.S. citizen kids in them. Um, then we looked very carefully at, like, we wanted to know how much job losses had affected people and also what factors had caused the job losses, because that also gives you a sense of what the solutions are or whether things are going to fix themselves or not. And what we saw is that um, the biggest chunk of people lost their job because of a temporary closure or staff reduction or hours reduction at their workplace. That in a way is good because it means that they can come back. At the same time, we have every indication that jobs haven't come back. So especially, for example, in, in restaurants, I, I interviewed a woman who told me, you know, she used to work at this gigantic restaurant. I've never heard of it, but it's called the Chateau. People in the right area would know it probably. Um, 
And she said, you know, they brought back the people who were deemed to be most in need. So she wasn't deemed to be as in need as a couple of the other workers. And they have told her, you know, it's not even worth coming, hun, because there's no, like, there's no customers. Nobody wants to come and eat si inside a restaurant. Um, so we know that a lot of those jobs are only partially back. Um, we also had a lot of people um, who just got sick. And uh, we had people who didn't want to get sick and quit because of that. I will get to more of this, but just note at the bottom, you know, like three quarters of the respondents reported at least one job loss in the household. That's a huge number. And um, oh, I meant to actually include uh, something on the undocumented in particular, but one of the things that we noticed in the undocumented population in particular is that they had a disproportionate number of people who lost jobs in the gig economy. Uh, and also in informal jobs like house cleaning, taking care of an elder, things like that. That was definitely um, an important impact for them because that's a lot of the kinds of work that undocumented immigrants can get. Um, we also asked people if they are still working, do they feel safe at their job? And uh, some of this varied. You could hear, you know, when we did interviews, people said, well, it took a while, but it's gotten better or whatever. But the majority do seem to feel that their job is safe. Uh, very few are working from home, and these were mostly upper middle class professionals who told us this, um, pretty much entirely, but not entirely, but there are some, you know, but it's, it's people who are in professional jobs. Um, almost a quarter said no, they do not feel safe of, at work. And then there was some percentage of people who feel actively abused or exploited, and others who are only working because they don't have paid sick time. And I know that um, Gerald is with us, and maybe she can tell us a little bit later, but I know that we have heard about this as a problem with some of the elder care people that uh, nursing homes have in some cases chosen to not, um, to not um, let people take sick leave even though they actually have to under the law. So that's a serious problem. Um, in the commuting part of the equation, you can also see that there are very big differences in how people, the, how people perceive the safety of their commute depending on how they travel. And uh, as, as a big fan of the T myself, this makes me very sad, but it's also the reality that I haven't ridden the T and um, a lot of people are very scared if they do have to ride it that they're gonna get infected. Um, most notable is that for me is at the very bottom, that, um, that bottom lit item, which came directly as a result of Don recommending that we add this as a, as a, as a checkbox in this category. And sure enough, uh, a little bit more than one in five respondents said that they feel afraid to be harassed or attacked due to their race. This is heavily an experience of the Asian respondents, but it is not exclusive to Asian respondents. There were also Latino and Black respondents who spoke about this as a concern. Second. Uh, then we asked, uh, you know, unemployment, as you know, has been a major source of income for people who lost their jobs, and especially with that $600 added every week, that has been the difference between people falling into poverty and not, and a very, very large share of people did not get unemployment. Um, and when we looked at the undocumented households, that number was much higher. The, pe the people in undocumented and, and mixed status households reported, 82% of them reported not getting unemployment. So even higher than this overall number, which is pretty, you know, I think 58% for the population as a whole is pretty serious and, and concerning. Pandemic unemployment assistance was help for some people. And that's important to remember because one of the discussions right now is whether to extend it. Um, we had some problems with people whose applications were delayed by a long time. And uh, this reflects also um, some people with TPS who've had a really hard time, who've been delayed, who've been rejected because their papers didn't say that they were still lawfully here, even though they are. Um, so that there's been some bureaucratic issues, although Massachusetts is much, much better than many other states. Um, look at the very high number that said uh, that they didn't qualify for unemployment because of immigration status and among the undocumented and mixed status households, it was even higher. It was basically 65%. Um, so this is important from my perspective because it tells us something that, you know, I, I've been asked about undocumented immigrants getting tested for a while. 
and um, it is it is a delicate question for us, obviously. But if you um, if you look at this, a very large share of people who got sick did not get tested. Um, the, at the left on the left side is the whole population. On the right is the undocumented mixed status uh, immigrants and uh, households. And you can see that um, there's very little difference. That the numbers are actually slightly better for the undocumented mixed status households. That I don't think there's any particular meaning to that. Um, but if, if you look at this, uh, undocumented people did, were not less likely to get tested, as far as we can tell, at least the ones who responded to us. We know that there are some people who were just too scared to go anywhere, and those people, yes, they also avoided care. Um, but we can see why did people not get tested. Um, there was, you know, the usual that we've all faced, didn't know where to go for testing or treatment. Um, a lot of people based the rationing, you know, that they tried to get tested and they were told, uh, you know, are you dying? Do you have a 105 fever? No, okay, then go away. Um, other people just assumed that that was what was gonna happen, so they didn't do it. Um, this includes, by the way, responses from people who didn't report getting sick, but who might have gotten tested otherwise or who considered getting tested. Um, note also that their, you know, public charge concerns were a factor for one in 10 people. Um, not being able to work if you tested positive was a factor. Not having insurance and being afraid of the cost, clearly not being aware of the fact that uh, COVID-19 testing and treatment are free in Massachusetts. We know that there was a story that, uh, that uh, was reported, I think it went in the Washington Post, of a man who died because he was afraid of the cost of testing and treatment. Um, and once again, looking at the bottom, you can see that uh, this is, I think, one in six people reported that they were afraid to be blamed or attacked due to their race. Uh, we heard from people that, you know, they felt like that they would be seen as somehow the vectors of disease. And this, again, is particularly concentrated among Asians, but it is not exclusive to Asians by any means. Um, and you can see with the undocumented population, the factors are a little bit different. You do see more of the fear of immigration, of immigration consequences in general, whether, it, you know, you see that there's more people who are afraid of the cost as well. Um, and you see um, public charge emerging as a very big concern. Um, looking at the stimulus funds, as you know, that, that $1,200 was a really big part of what made people survive too, and 500 per child. Uh, you see that, you know, slightly over a third of respondents and more than a quarter of respondents in undocumented and mixed status households say they got not a penny. Um, and uh, only 30% of respondents got it for everybody. Um, I noticed that on the right side, you, there's a, a handful of people who said that they got it for everybody in their household. And I suspect there's some misunderstanding or mistake there uh, because obviously they couldn't. Um, we will take questions at the end if that's okay. Uh, but yes, please do put in uh, this. Please do keep your hand raised, and you can also put comments or questions in um, in your um, in the in the chat box. That would be fantastic. Um, going back to this, you know, health insurance is obviously a factor here, uh, but um, a lot of people, um, you know, depend on Mass Health Limited and and Health Safety Net. Uh, Mass Health itself is also a very so big source of um, of coverage. This includes a lot of the kids in particular, all those US citizen kids in, in these families. Uh, we had some college students who responded to the survey and they often have been forced to buy health insurance. You know, if you're a full-time college student in Massachusetts, you have to buy comprehensive coverage. Uh, so some of them are buying comprehensive coverage while their family doesn't have it for themselves. Um, and when you look at undocumented and mixed status families, you see an even greater dependence on Mass Health Limited and, and Health Safety Net. And it's important to note that you know Mass Health Limited and Health Safety Net is really um, is really important uh, and does provide really valuable coverage, especially through this pandemic. But it does not provide comprehensive coverage. Um, when we asked about how people are doing with their housing, um, it you know this a lot of people are doing fine, but this means that two out of five are not. Um, 
the most common reason is uh, that they don't, uh, that they're renting an apartment and are behind on the rent. Uh, some people are renting a room as well. Um, some people are renting an apartment, but if you ask them what the apartment is, it sure as hell looks like a room. Um, people are living in, in very, very tight conditions, but paying very high rent. Um, we had some cases also of people who, who either had to leave because of abuse or who flagged to us that they need to get away from their abuser but have nowhere to go. And again, big thanks to Dawn for suggesting that those two uh, answers because they gave us important information about people who desperately need help. Um, when you look at the situation among uh, undocumented and mixed status households, you can see a far, far more severe housing crisis there. Um, it's pretty scary. Um, give you a second to digest that. And now, uh, when it comes to, does your household have enough to eat? Um, these questions, it's important to remember, people had check all that apply. And a lot of people checked, we're doing fine and don't need help, and then proceeded to say, um, oh yeah, but like, we've also been going to the food bank. Or, um, you know, yeah, we've gotten cash assistance from a community organization or something like that. So that included um, 25 of the ones, you know, who did, who did were, were doing fine. But we also, you know, some of these benefits, SNAP is really important, obviously, food stamps. Um, a lot of people have applied for those and been able to get some help from that uh, for their U.S. citizen kids, usually. Um, pandemic EBT was huge. Uh, I interviewed people who said that, you know, that little bit of money was, you know, a couple of grocery trips, and that was very helpful. Cash assistance has been very helpful for those who have received it, but it's a small number. Um, food is much more common, going to a food pantry or having food delivered to your house by Patricia Solalvaro in her car. Uh, <laughs> um, and, um, and note also that there are people who are afraid of seeking help because they are immigrants, and that's pretty scary. Uh, and we know that that is very much the case more broadly, that you know, some of the people who are afraid to get assistance as immigrants are also afraid to fill out a survey that tells us that. And you can see all the numbers are much more severe among the undocumented and mixed status families. Um, more than three quarters of people said that, you know, did, it indicated some housing, some food insecurity in their household or that they're already receiving food assistance. And you have to remember these food pantries, some of them are not doing as much as they were doing before because surely the crisis is over, right? And it's definitely not. Um, and I know I, I, I went and watched the, the food distribution at Chelsea Collaborative, which is really impressively industrial scale and fast. And there is just an enormous amount of demand for food assistance. Um, lastly, you know, we ask people, if you have children, do you have access to childcare right now? If you go back and look before, you know, 14, 15% almost of respondents had told us that lack of childcare had forced them to stop working. And in interviews, several moms directly linked their ability to work to their children being back in school because they're having the small kids at home meant that they couldn't leave them alone. Um, so this very, very low number of people who have access to childcare is a problem. Um, and a very large number of, you know, 56% of our respondents have at least one small child in the household. And of course, this is a gendered problem. This is mostly moms who are telling us these things. Um, so now I will turn this back over to Eva to um to talk more about uh to talk more about uh the policy implications thank you um thank you so much marion for the enormous work that um that you have done when we look into the data that marion just presented and also read the um some of the stories and the interviews that she conducted for the project one of the biggest takeaway is wow, immigrants are really strong. They are resilient and courageous people. Um, you know that many of the families here in Commonwealth, uh, immigrant families are living in difficult conditions. Half of the, half of the non-citizens in Massachusetts live below 250% of poverty uh, level, and more than a quarter live below 125% of the poverty level. And we know that we live in a very expensive state 
uh, and the cost of living really um, impacted uh, immigrant families when they lost their jobs and they lost their income. They ran out of money very quickly. Um, and then their businesses, the businesses that they were working got closed and many people got sick. Millions of Americans were in the same situation, but most of them qualified for unemployment. And if not that, for the pandemic unemployment assistance. They got the extra $600 per week, which has been a lifesaver for so many, and it must extend it. And they got stimulus checks, $1,200 per person, plus the $500 per child. Uh, that's not one or two, you know, month rent, but it's, it's still a lot of help. And as you saw in the data, um, some of the immigrants also uh, got those benefits too. At least the US citizens uh, in their families uh, did. Some got SNAP for their children um, and pandemic um, EBT, an excellent program that gives money for food to the families and low income um, school children. But a lot of immigrants were excluded. Undocumented immigrants cannot get unemployment, even if they pay taxes every year and they use the tax identification number, um, they fam their families were denied um, stimulus payment. The estimation is that 57,000 people are, effect are affected in Massachusetts alone. So um, one of the main takeaways, of course, of the survey is that it's time for Congress to stop discriminating against immigrant families. We need equitable and inclusive COVID response at both state and federal level. In May, the House of Representatives um, passed the HEROES Act, which included several uh, very good provisions. Another round of stimulus check this time, including ITIN uh, files, free coverage for COVID-19 uh, testing and treatment under emergency Medicaid, uh, an expansion of the SNAP, an extension of the pandemic EBT, and, and suspension of the public charge rule that has been highly publicized. And you know that um, that has made so many immigrants terrified of getting any kind of assistance uh, out of fear of being deported or not um, getting their green card. Protection for DACA and TPS recipients for the duration of the crisis so they don't have to worry about uh, losing their work authorization as a result, losing their jobs. The HEALS Act introduced this week, um, even if you don't consider immigrants, it's a non-starter. Um, it is completely inappropriate to respond to national crises by excluding all working families. And um, we know that the Senate is negotiating. I'm sure you've seen the press in the last few days. Uh, Senator Rubio uh, from the Republican Party is very much agreeing with the Democrats. And we hope really that uh, they will work out a deal in the Senate. But our message uh, is to the Senate to not negotiate immigrants out of yet another deal. It's a matter of justice. And um, going to the, to the state level, one of the areas that um, I wanted to mention is the language access. Mira has been working hard and advocating on the language access piece, and we're grateful that we got the attention of the administration as a result of the advocacy. There are now uh, the applications online for um, the unemployment assistance application is now in five languages, but we need it to be in 13 or even more to really reflect the diversity of our um, immigrant communities here in Massachusetts. A second very important piece at the state level related to uh, multilingual and public outreach across the state that remains also a very, very important uh, issue to really make sure that we have posting and ads and information at the storefronts everywhere, whatever it takes to address the fear, to address the confusion that immigrants have, the fear from the public charge, the fear of uh, getting food and getting, um, getting basic food will cost them uh, to get deported. So that it's really, really key that multilingual and public outreach across the state. Um, the other important piece is that um, we need to have safety net uh, programs at the state level that are responding to this enormous crisis. 
I'm very happy to say that at the state level, uh, the governor just signed uh, the supplemental budget that approved 10 million uh, for cash assistance for the most vulnerable families in our Commonwealth. We also made important progress this week on the raft of the 20 million on the housing uh, program that it's the best answer right now to give an opportunity to families who are facing facing the crisis and um, the governor also signed a moratorium um, but we need to go beyond that and make sure that um, that issue is addressed as long as the um, pandemic is continuing. And also, uh, before I turn it over to the panel and let them um, respond uh, to the findings and the implications, I also wanted to mention uh, five uh, different bills uh, that are um, that we, that Mira has been advocating for with our members and our partners at the state level that are extremely, extremely important. As as you heard, uh, this survey really uh, confirms that. One, the uh, emergency uh, medical leave expansion. So workers don't have to choose between taking care of their health and their loved one or uh, getting paid. So we need an expansion of that. The second is the Work and Family Mobility Act because our survey shows a lot of people depend on public transit but don't actually feel safe using it. And just as important as many people can get their when they need to get, they need to drive. So everyone who drives need to be licensed and need to be uh, insured. Uh, the other important bill is the Safe Communities Act, uh, you know, that addresses the fear uh, that the community members uh, have. In addition to that, um, I will mention the expansion uh, of, the made, of the paid emergency sick leave which is another, uh, another bill in the legislature. The first one was what MassHealth expanded, but this is the, the legislative item that I'm talking about. Um, the other piece is the stimulus tax credit for immigrants, the taxpayers bill, uh, a Senate bill that um, Senator Eldridge led that would really address the issue of 50, uh, 57,000 uh, people in, uh, in our state. And the fifth one I'll mention is the Housing Stability Act, which, by the way, has a hearing um, in, the, in the committee next week, a very important bill that will really extend uh, the emergency on evictions for another year beyond, beyond the, um, the end, a year beyond the, uh, beyond the crisis. And that would really address the issue of the Massachusetts uh, Housing Court is uh, estimating about 20,000 eviction cases to be filed. So that bill is another very, uh, very important one. So I'll stop there um, and we'll take questions at the end, but I would like to turn it over to Marion to uh, moderate the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Eva. Everybody can hear me right, yes. Um, so I wanted to, uh, uh, I wanted to start by inviting a handful of people to give us some of their comments uh, and their responses. What did you think of the data? Did it resonate with you? Do you find that it is, um, it, it, does, it, does it reflect what you're seeing on the ground and are there specific things that you saw there where you think we can do something about it or we're doing something and we should do a lot more of it? So I'll start with uh, Chief Martinez from the city of Boston. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marian, and, and, um, and thank you, Mira, for this really important um, data and work, and I appreciate you sharing the detail. I mean, for me and for the city, I think the piece that was most striking has to do with um, sort of the access to care and getting tested and, and ensuring that it's an accessible place. Um, and it uh, is not, was not surprising to me at all that uh, er, early on in the, epidemic, uh, in the pandemic, people were struggling to get tested due to needing to, have to be symptomatic, due to lack of information about what, whether or not it would be free, and, and making sure the testing was widespread. And so I wasn't surprised to sort of see some of the information related to those pieces. I think a lot of that has been addressed in terms of 
um, making testing more accessible in neighborhoods. And much of testing is now available to folks who are asymptomatic and symptomatic. But it draws the larger question, I would argue, that the data also presented, which was still the fear of people feeling like they can access testing, even in the face of seeing that it's free, but seeing also that I might not have insurance. What will this say about, does it, uh, what does it say to me about whether or not I'm a public charge and what that feels like in terms of the misinformation that's been out there in the community, as well as whether or not people can take advantage of it. So I think the data has shown us specifically in Boston um, that we've seen a disproportionate impact on our black African-American community Community, but also our, our Latino community. Um, and if you overlay the neighborhoods that have most been most disproportionately impacted, we're talking about black and brown immigrants. Um, and so it's not surprising that there has definitely been a cause for concern and, and the impact that's been there and people are feeling that uh, directly um, in terms of getting care and getting access to care. Um, so, I, you know, I want to be brief, but I, I do think it's really important that we remember that although we've lifted up testing, although we've lifted up, um, you know, contact tracing, and although we've done a lot to try to contain COVID, it's still those folks that are, that are inequitably impacted that are still being um, connected to and being sort of at the end result of the spread of COVID, whether it's because of essential jobs, whether it's because of the need for public transportation, whether it's because of all the needs that are in front of us. So the data uh, highlighted some things for me and I know as a, as a local government I want to take the data and be able to help us understand are we doing enough to reach our immigrant communities with messaging which has been really important to make sure that testing is accessible and that people can not only get tested um, but get the messaging needed about how to keep themselves healthy and their families as well. So again thank you for the information um, and I'm eager to figure out how we can take what you all learned and use it as local policy policymakers to sort of shape some of our strategies. Thank you so much. And just so you know, and we, I haven't done this, but we can do this. We have this disaggregated by zip code. So we have the capacity to pull out all the Boston's if that would be helpful to you. That would be really great. I would appreciate that. Okay, great. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Gilbert Calderon, who has a message from Senator Warren. As you know, the Senate is a very, very big pl uh, place where things are happening right now on what happens with, uh, on, on the next round of COVID-19 relief. So Gilbert, are you online and ready to speak? Well, my name is Gilbert Caldron, and I'm a representative from Senator Warren's office. Um, while the Senator is unable to be here today, I will be delivering a brief statement on her behalf. But before I do, I just want to say thank you to Ira um, for putting this event together, and especially you, Marianne, as well, and to all the other, you know, community stakeholders that, you know, are fighting every single day for, you know, immigrants all across the Commonwealth and for also obtaining, you know, this critical data um, as well. So really, thank you. And let me begin by reading the Senator's statement. Uh, Hello, Vera. I'm sorry I cannot be here with you in person today, but I'm glad to, I, I get to pass this message along to you. I want to begin by thanking you for your strong, persistent advocacy on behalf of our immigrant and refugee communities here in Massachusetts. You provide invaluable resources and services for immigrant neighbors and friends, and work tirelessly to ensure that the Commonwealth is a place where everyone can thrive. I'm grateful to have you as a partner. This pandemic has hit immigrant communities especially hard, creating an even steeper and even rockier path for people already facing uphill battles to success in this country. Here in Massachusetts, we're seeing our immigrant communities and communities of color disproportionately suffering the cost of this pandemic, a reality that is reflected in disparate rates of COVID-19 infection and unemployment rates. As the Senate works on the next coronavirus relief package, we need to ensure that all of our residents, regardless of immigration status, are able to weather this crisis. We will need to extend and expand the eviction moratorium nationwide to ensure that families don't need to fear homelessness during this unprecedented time. We also need to support working families by passing an essential workers' bill of rights, fully funding support for child care providers and providing another round of stimulus payments that are inclusive to all within our community regardless of immigration status. Finally, as we work to contain the spread of COVID-19, we must ensure immigrants in Massachusetts have access to COVID-19 tests and treatments without barriers to care. With Mira's partnership, I've been fighting for all these important measures and more. I'm glad that Mira has directly consulted Massachusetts immigrants regarding their experience during this pandemic. 
The responses help us to address these issues head on. We must continue advocating alongside our immigrant communities for inclusive policies that promote access to opportunity. Keep up the fight, I'm with you all the way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Josie, are you ready? Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Great, okay. So um, again, good morning. My name is Josie Valentin. I'm a state policy advisor for Senator Ed Markey. Uh, very honored to be here with you this morning on a Friday morning. Um, I am based in Western Mass, uh, but I am working with the Senator on a statewide level and part of my portfolio includes LGBT rights, uh, Latinx issues and others. And so obviously uh, when it comes to the topic of immigration and a lot of the folks that obviously were included in this survey, um, there's a big overlap um, with a lot of the folks that, that I'm working with statewide. So um, thank you for the invite. And, um, and I want to go ahead and, and read the statement from Senator Markey, um, just like um, Gilbert did. So, uh, good morning. Thank you to my friends at MIRA and the many other organizations that collaborated to distribute this important survey. Thank you as well to the more than 400 households across the Commonwealth that responded. Right now, immigrant communities are suffering disproportionately during the coronavirus pandemic. Congress has a moral obligation to support all individuals during times of crisis. This is especially true for vulnerable populations. We must provide the economic, health care, and other relief that they need. This survey is an important step in helping us understand the impact of this pandemic so that we can move forward and enact meaningful policies. I am proud to fight for policies that protect immigrant communities, policies that make critical resources available to everyone who needs them during this crisis. That includes Medicaid coverage for coronavirus related healthcare services, testing and treatment to everyone who needs them regardless of citizenship status. We must automatically extend work authorizations for DACA recipients and TPS holders and other impacted immigrants. We need direct monthly payments to those struggling to make ends meet during this pandemic. I have legislation with Senator Kamala Harris and Bernie Sanders that does just that. It would provide $2,000 a month to individuals until the public health crisis is over, regardless of whether or not they have filed a recent tax return or have a social security number. We see that so many of our essential workers are immigrants and come from immigrant communities. They need more hazard pay and personal protective equipment, PPE. And Massachusetts needs assurance that the federal government is there to support all of us in this time of need. I will be fighting for these resources during these contentious coronavirus negotiations. We will not, re we will not let Republicans ignore the workers and families who have sacrificed so much to keep essential services running. We cannot leave anyone behind. And as Congress considers further legislation to respond to the pandemic, I will continue fighting for paid sick leave student borrower relief, funding to close the homework gap for low-income students, and to extend rent and mortgage moratoriums. This moment demands justice for our immigrant communities. I am committed to ensuring that we adequately respond to these immediate needs while also charting a path to a genuinely healthier and more equitable future through a just recovery. That means pathway to citizenship for the 11 million immigrants who are already here. I will continue to fight on behalf of our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, and our loved ones, all who make up the rich tapestry of life here in the United States. Immigrants built this country, and we can never forget that. Thank you again to Mira and to the many other organizations that made this survey possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josie. Um, so I just remembered that I forgot one slide, so I am going to show you this slide for just a second because, oops. Is that the right one? No, am I, I don't think I'm showing the right thing. I don't think I am. Your PowerPoint document. Yeah, I'm showing my PowerPoint document because yeah. screen sharing is so much harder than it needs to be. Yeah. There it is, now that's the right one. I wanted to just take a moment for a brief com commercial interruption to thank all the people who made this possible. So let me tell you, doing a, Getting 433 responses turns out to require a little drop of blood for everyone. Um, it, is inc it was a very, very hard endeavor to get all these people to respond. Of course, we were asking them very intimate questions too. So uh, like the Senator mentioned, you know, every one of the people who answered this survey and their 
our couple on the line, deserve our great, great appreciation because they trusted us with information that is very, very sensitive for their lives. And it's very important that, um, that we got that information and we are very grateful to them. We're also very grateful to our partners who gave us extra efforts here. Uh, Reach Beyond Domestic Violence, Gladys basically texted all her ladies. Um, and if you know Gladys Ortiz, you know that this is what she does. She just sends out a text or calls them or asks them and they respond. And several of her clients responded and it was, they gave us some really, really fantastic material. Um, Ipsy, uh, Gerald, you are a treasure. I am so grateful to have you as a partner and as a friend. And Ipsy did a huge amount of outreach along with Pastor Kiki and uh, True Alliance Center. And uh, we got excellent representation from Haitians, not only uh, responding in Haitian Creole and French, but also in, um, in English. And uh, they also helped us with translation, which was huge. Agencia Alpha just to totally blew us away. Uh, Agencia Alpha did such a fantastic job. And Catherine, you are the smartest and most brilliant and awesome 17 year old I have ever encountered. Uh, Catherine is on the line, so she gets extra thanks from me. Brazilian Workers Center, Lenita Reason did an amazing job doing outreach to Brazilians. Um, Chelsea Collaborative, uh, they are so crazy busy. And that photo in the middle, by the way, I loved watching that food line. They, they, they did, it is amazing how fast they work at feeding hundreds of people in a day. Um, and then ATASC, Dawn has just been amazing as, as a partner in getting it, you know, to get that huge a representation, almost a third of our, our of our responses from the Asian community was really fantastic and did, it involved a lot of language access. Dawn is really living the language access piece of this. So we're very, very proud to be partners with her. And just so you know, the, the Asian side of this survey will continue despite the fact that the major survey is over because we wanna continue sampling in the Asian communities. Um, and we're very grateful to FIRM because they made this project possible with their funding. So thank you very much. And now that we have completed our commercial announcements, let me go on to Patricia, please. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Marion, and the entire Mira uh, team for leading this effort. I, if I understand it, it's the first one here in the Commonwealth. And um, just so grateful for the analysis and the data and, and your heart that you put into this. Um, I also want to um, thank Catherine, who's done an amazing job. I, I just wanted to um, make a couple of comments. Um, the picture that you saw, it, it, uh, many of you know Vilma Galvez, she's our legal director. The t-shirt the, the, the that she has is the name of our campaign. It's called Immigrants Make America Strong. And one thing that resonates, um, and I think Eva, you mentioned it at the beginning, is that our community, our immigrant community is strong. It's resilient. I think that numbers would have been a lot worse um, if it's not already in us to overcome, to um, just to deal with what we have on top of all the issues that we are already facing as a community. And I think the data, Marion, that you're putting out here, it's just uh, another example, right, of, of the history of this country, how it, for many centuries it has excluded our immigrant community. I, I feel that Something to point out is that many of the respondents, don't forget, they are, are already connected to an organization. So in one way or another, they have been to some of our workshops or they have received our emails or they have received our information about workers' rights, uh, where to get testing, um, all the information that the AG's office puts out. But even despite all the work that we're doing, Clearly, there's a need to do more outreach because the fear is so palpable that I can tell you countless stories of when we will call people, uh, the way that we um, have been distributing funding, and I should also mention, um, I'm one of the three uh, steering committee members of the Massachusetts Immigrant Collaborative, and Ronnie, who's also on this call, is, is a member, you know, through the Boston Resiliency Fund and some of the other foundations. Uh, Alpha has been able to disperse over $140,000 to families. And after they submitted their request, we will call them to get information. You have no idea how many people hung up on me, how many people were very, they were not trusting that I, that it was, that I had money for them. People turned, people didn't want to come to our food pantries. 
People were so afraid that that was going to have an impact on their immigration case. And one last comment that I want to make, let us not forget that, you know, I, I was, um, I was struck by that uh, statistic that says that a lot of people said we're fine, we're better. But I think we need to take that into context for an immigrant person to tell you they're fine. They could be fine, but they could be, you know, they could be hungry, they could be in pain, they could be suffering, but it is in us that we don't want, it's that perception that we don't want to seem like we're going to be a charge to the government, that we don't want to be seen as, oh, we can't do it, right? Because all the xenophobic messages that we've been getting and all that racism and all these perceptions that we're here to take people's jobs. So let's not forget that. People may tell us they're fine, but only God knows what they're going through. So as a community advocate, we need to do more outreach to educate our uh, members of, of these bills, of these protections. But at the state level, at the federal level, we cannot continue to allow our legislators to exclude our immigrants. It's like basically saying, you know what? We're not humans. Our dignity is not enough. It's not about, you know, should we save this person from dying or not because of the legal status? I think that's immoral. And I think that we need to continue to push for the driver's license bill, for the Safe Community Act, for any stimulus package. We need to include our immigrant brothers and sisters who are out there being the essential workers. And I can't thank you enough, Marianne and Mira, for leading this effort, because God knows that whether it's with data or stories, we need to do more for our um, legislators to understand that immigrants do make this country um, a strong country. And to the level that we understand that we cannot exclude them anymore, um, something has to change. And it has to start with, with us pushing that message onto them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. How about Gerald? I'll answer your question live. Gerald, can you please give us a little bit of your perspective? Thank you, thank you, Marion. I think I uh, great, great data, and I uh, agree with Patricia that every single, single time when we see that, uh, the response is said, I am doing fine. We need to really dig down to know exactly what does it mean to be to, to say that I'm fine. And uh, same uh, examples here where we call families that we know are in distress to offer support. And they will say, well, you know, I'm okay, I'm okay. And when we take the time to talk and to dig and you find out that they are going through so much that they should have been the first one to come forward and ask for help. But again, because of fear, they will say that I'm fine. And one of the uh, uh, piece of the data that uh, Marion that I would love for all of us to pay attention to is around childcare. I think uh, as we are thinking about reopening the school, and as we are thinking about you know two days a week being in school and three days being at home, I think this is a real, real big one that we have to pay attention to because our children are going to be left behind. Most of our immigrants are still essential workers. They have to go to work. And now here they are fighting whether or not to stay home with their children or to take them with them at work. So I think uh, when we look at 58% uh, of uh, families saying that they didn't have access to childcare, this is something that we have to pay a lot of attention because immigrant families are going to suffer deeply, not only the parents, but the children who represent our future. So again, great, great job, Mira. I know how many phone calls take that you have to do to make sure that you get those data and I applaud your courage and your energy. So we could not do it without you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Gerald, uh, and thank you for all you did to get us a great Haitian community response. Ronnie, how about you go next? Let's mix it up. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good morning. Ronnie Miller from the Rian Immigrant Center and also on the steering committee of the Massachusetts uh, Immigrant um, Collaborative. Um, so thanks so much, Marion and Eva, for this incredible survey and this really important data that we were really missing. We knew in our hearts and that this was the story that we were hearing, but to have the data has been so important. Um, so I, you know, I just want to say that um, our, my focus, our focus has really been around the cash assistance and the food assistance in the last four and a half months. Back in early April, uh, a number of the Boston-based immigrant support groups came together and we were really concerned 
uh, that our families were losing their jobs and that there was real food insecurity. That's what we were hearing from our families. We approached the Boston Resilience Fund and with the leadership of Mayor of Boston and Chief Marty Martinez, we were able to get a, a support. There were 11 organizations, a really diverse group of organizations who were working closely with those who were undocumented and not eligible for unemployment. And really our role was to come together in partnership and collaborative and to really um, sort of respect the privacy and the dignity of the families and figure out a way that would be easy and fast to get cash directly to those families that needed to pay for rent, needed to pay for meals and food, um, and yet to do that in a very sort of accountable and transparent way. So we developed a sort of a system of equal disbursement to the partners. Um, we, the, organ, the, the, the collaborative has, in the last four and a half months, has really grown to be statewide. The Massachusetts Immigrant Collaborative, we've received $3.3 million. And I really want to say that the uh, philanthropic um, community foundations, um, you know, the Boston Resilience Fund, but the MA COVID Fund, a lot of family foundations have really come in and there's been tremendous support from foundations for um, immigrant families. And I really want to sort of acknowledge that, that the, um, you know, that the that, that funders have, been, have really stepped up at this time to support families. So um, this is, you know, um, it, it, we're four and a half months into this and it's going to continue. We're in this real um, difficult time because people are still not getting their jobs back, people's rent pressures, fear of eviction, not being able to have money to buy groceries, and where I feel as if we're still very much in the middle of this. Um, so it's been um, um, a privilege to sort of work with all of the immigrant support partners and sort of helping with that and to support the families, a tremendous sort of gratitude from people. A $500 cash assistance can be a lifesaver for families. It can stop eviction for a month and it, and, um, and, and it can be, you know, uh, it, we're just hearing a tremendous sort of gratitude from families for, um, in, in, uh, um, for, for that. So I'm, I'm just impressed by all of the data. Thank you for all of that. We're in, it's, it's very challenging times. We're still in the middle of it. And I just appreciate everybody's partnership right across the, the community. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Um, next, I am going to uh, ask Dawn from ATASK to say a few words. And again, thank you so much, Dawn. Like you have been such an amazing partner and you made the survey better. You didn't just get answers, you made the survey better. So I am so grateful for that. Dawn, you're muted. Or you're not getting, you're not muted, but you're not actually there. Yeah, sorry, I have like two speakers here. I keep forgetting which one's on and which one's off. But thank you, Tamara. I really appreciate this partnership, and um, it's been it's been really exciting. But I had I had I think two points to make. Um, one was in relationship to the data, and the second one was something I kind of think I talk about a lot, which is around language mar marginalization. But the first I wanted to talk about in regards to the data was um, in thinking about unemployment, work safety, and immigration status and some underlying currents underneath that around exploitation. And so immigrants being exploited by their employers, by their landlords who are leveraging both the employees and the tenant's status, their lack of English proficiency and their lack of education and education in the US to skirt the moratorium on eviction or safety issues at work. And so often there, these, this is the group, this marginalized sort of vulnerable population that often doesn't qualify for the economic, economic safety nets around the moratorium on eviction, around unemployment, around the PUA and expanded SNAP, SNAP benefits. So I think what's happening is that a lot of their economic safety is actually reliant upon the client funds provided by foundations or the Boston Resiliency Fund or the Mass COVID funds. So I just wanted to make that point and acknowledge that, that a lot of the client funds or the supports that are re being received for these vulnerable populations is coming through client funds. Um, so that was one of the points. So the second one I wanted to point out was around language access. And I know that this is something that I think a lot of bilingual providers and bilingual agencies are really recognizing um, and, and notice as well and feel. 
is that the services are English dominant. And under COVID-19, these have only exacerbated exponentially. And the real burden is placed on these by multilingual providers right now, and it's overwhelming. And it's often an invisible burden. So while the multilingual providers are both trying to like live and learn um, and explain this information around the insurances, around getting information out there around COVID-19. Um, this is something that we, I think that we as a state need to do better with, do better with our language access plan and thinking about who's most impacted and who's most burdened by providing the safety net for the state, for a state around language access. So I think those are my two primary points around and uh, in thinking through also the data as well. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm going to open it up to questions or comments from anybody who would like to participate for like, like we can take about three. But uh, first, I want to give Dini a chance from Chelsea Collaborative to just give us some quick comments because Chelsea is such an important perspective here. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mira, for putting this together and conducting the survey. I know that given the circumstances that um, we are living in, we are stretched very thin as people that are on the ground. Um, I do have a couple of responses and comments from, um, you know, we've been on in very dire conditions in Chelsea. You guys have seen um, the data. We became um, the Epic Center very early on. Um, we are a community that, you know, 69% uh, Latinx immigrant. Um, we have a, a good percentage of them that are undocumented. Um, only 89% of, uh, of the high school, um, of the school in Chelsea are uh, Latinx um, immigrants or from immigrant parents. And 80% um, of our working um, for workforce are vulnerable workers, uh, essential workers. Um, so I just want to bring that into perspective because when we talk about the different issues and challenges that we are facing as a community, even though this is, imp is impacting directly to Chelsea, this is a state issue, this is a regional issue. Um, when we're talking about um, the Chelsea Collaborative amongst the allies on the ground, I've been pushing um, the uh, contract tracing, you know, how this community became, how we as a community became the um, epic center. What were the behaviors that um, impacted us and what is it that we're going to do to change? It's important that we elevate this message to be able to work with um, in, uh, medical institutions to be able to actually provide what were the root cause. We already know that we have one of the worst um, uh, transportation system in the entire state, the 111. You know, uh, we already know that our workers, undocumented workers, are being picked up by um, private companies, the white, what we call the white bands, in the different corners for the four ships, and they are being, you know, pushed in into overcrowding Boston to go back and forth from Boston to Chelsea. Um, you know, I say that because we do remember that a lot of workers are, are very impacted and are impacted because they work in the food and hospitality industry, those are the industries that were impacted the most and the workers are not going back. They're not receiving the phone call back. Um, we really need to um, assess the overcrowding condition, the sub-leasing condition that is, um, it is also a pandemic that we actually facing in our community and um, it definitely has affect uh, the, the virus. The fact that people, that our residents um, we're afraid to go into the system to get checked um, and they just stay home and, you know, obviously use um, medicine from home um, uh, to, you know, prevent or cure themselves. They tell us this story. We have seen, you know, the lines increasing by the week. It's not going away. We actually, um, as the organization itself, I mean, uh, Marion, you were there. Um, you know what exactly what I'm talking about. Um, it's going around around corners um, and the collaborative don't want to have the lines this long. We wanted to come up with a home delivery system, right? And we lack of resources. And I know that we are talking about thanking the philanthropy industry. I say, you know, thank you for um, looking at this and you need to do more. 
And we cannot start talking about, if you guys are not in the community, we cannot save those things because we are the ones suffering. You know, we are still demanding from a local and state government um, to continue to support. We have a, even though the momentorium bill has been extended, we have thousands of families that we know that we are keeping track of that have not paid rent for five months. All those um, families are going to be evicted. All those families are being threatened to be evicted verbally. Um, and now the one tactic that landlords are using is raising the rent. Um, I mean, I can, tell you, I can tell you this is going to be longer, like a longer conversation. I know Marion is going to tell me too that I don't have that much time. But I mean, I, I do think that I am looking forward for media to lead a, a conversation about what we're seeing in the ground and potential solutions. Um, because it's not enough. We need to bring all, everybody on board. We need to talk about, you know, what our, our families, undocumented families, are most afraid of. They don't have food on the table. They're coming out, even though they, they're infected, um, because their pantries are empty and they have hungry kids at home. So we need to do better. Thank you, Marian. Thank you so much, Nini. Uh, I just put the, the link to the slides uh, in the chat for everybody, and we'll also follow up. Um, I see Elo Eloisa has her hand raised. Yes, I just want to mention, um, um, I don't want to repeat everybody, thank you for the survey, or just go straight to the issues that I think are most important in our community besides all the ones that you have mentioned. You know, um, homelessness, we have seen an increase. We started uh, to, about three weeks ago, we started a, um, a group of Portuguese speaking um, organizations to talk about this because we have noticed an increase uh, that is really concerned. Uh, mental health, um, divorce, we have, there was, a, I think last week, one day in the week, I got five women calling me asking for a family in, uh, lawyer because they need to separate from their husbands. Uh, and everybody, the psychologist, everybody are telling me that they have seen a lot of uh, separation and uh, domestic violence. We need to assess these topics. Um, I think if we could do a second part of the survey um, to assess this because they have a huge impact in our community besides, you know, besides uh, job loss and not have access to any uh, financial help. We, we probably have um, helped with the National Domestic Workers Alliance about $240,000 we have dispersed to families and about 600 um, food boxes um, to people. But I am concerned uh, that August, we, 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 we won't have uh, food for August. This is the last day they're gonna drop some box and um, our funds are ending. So hopefully the state will come up with something because I know the money is there ever, but I haven't seen how it's gonna be distributed. So hopefully this will happen in August because people are really desperate for money. Um, thank you so much, uh, Eloisa. And just so you know, we, we are hoping to do a follow-up survey um, in the fall, and, uh, but we, we haven't, we, we just started talking about that. But there's definitely, I mean, every, every one of these answers, you know, is a whole rabbit hole. And, there, and, and we know also the things that we missed just because when we talk to people and sometimes, you know, you, you start a conversation and then just they randomly mention something and you're like, oh my God, I should have asked about that. Um, and, and, and I think that th there's also, we need to talk more about how we reach the people that we didn't reach and, and we're not sure how to do that yet. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done for sure. Thank, thank you, Marion. So I just wanted to say thank you so much, everyone, for participating. A big thank you to our members and also to our amazing panelists for their very thoughtful uh, remarks. And as you know, as I talked in the beginning, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. There is a lot of work at the state and at the federal level. I do want to echo what uh, Ronnie said to thank the philanthropy for stepping in. Uh, it has been an amazing, amazing effort. 
um, and not just you know supporting with the cash assistance by being very strong advocates uh, from the Fish Family Foundation to Carmen Foundation to Bard to the Boston Foundation to EOS Foundation who put over a million. Andrea has been a, an amazing advocate working with us and this is an effort that we are all uh, working together. We have a lot of work to do. I'm very happy to do it with all of you. And just one quick reminder that the legislature extended the former, um, the former legislative session out till the end of the calendar year. Um, and so the work continues, the fight continues, and also they will negotiating the budget uh, in October. So we have a lot of work to do. It's an expensive work. Uh, and we also need to fundraise in addition to doing our work. So I'm very happy that to partner with you to do this work with all of you and my deepest thanks for being with us today and all the incredible work that you do. And Marion, a million thanks to you as well.